Hi everyone, welcome back to Novel Nomad and welcome to my Aussie April wrap up. I had a, such a wonderful reading month for April. I read some really amazing books that I've been putting off for so long. It was honestly the best feeling to actually get them done, get them read and also get them rated because they were quality reads. I really thoroughly enjoyed them. So what I thought I'd do is I'd do a quick wrap up of all the books that I read and some of the ones that I didn't quite get to that I'm not on my official TBR but ones that I definitely want to get to in the future and explore more fantastic Aussie lit. So first off I read The Scholar by Devla McTernan. This is the second in the Cormac Riley series and I really thoroughly enjoyed this. It's I think it slightly suffers from second book itis, where it's not quite as amazing as the first, but it was still a really thoroughly brilliant read. I really enjoyed it. It had a very interesting plot line where it was kind of dealing with more academic politics as well as um, the corruption within the wealthy classes and almost this um, isolation from different wealthier classes as well. So this was really, really brilliant. Um, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this one. And it once again had really amazing, strong female characters. There's another female police detective in this, which um, she appeared in the first book, but she has more of a shining light in this book. And it, she was absolutely amazing. I can't wait if Devlin McTernan starts to write more about that character in the following books. It will be brilliant. I don't want to give too much away just because I feel like there's elements of the comic situation which reflects greatly on what happened at the end of the first book. But the academic scene was really thoroughly fascinating as well as being in more, um, not political, but more money gained um, academics where it's more pharmacy based science research. So big money is behind all this research funds and what they do for those funds and how it's almost a corrupt system. You're not researching for the sake of researching, you're researching to get what the um, bio wants rather than finding out what you know they might need. Um, but yeah, thoroughly enjoy this book. Recommend great mystery, excellent crime, really really good crime. Next I read Across the Nightingale Floor by Leanne Hen. I've been needing to read this for quite a while. I did get the push from one of my lovely co-workers at the bookstore I work at. Highly, highly, highly recommended these to me. And um, I read it incredibly quickly. It was such a fascinating blend of feudal Japan set in one of the southern islands blended in with a bit more like fantastical ninja style things and the main character you follow him from being um, a village kid who gets wrapped up in this huge warlord battle and he basically is adopted by the Otori clan when in fact he is part of the tribe and um, the tribe is where his father was from and that's like a secret arts ninja. They have like extra powers and oh, it was just so fascinating. The politics, not just of the warlord and this kind of really unstable system that was occurring, but also the politics between the tribe and where they sit within different matters within the, within the state. Um, they often um, mer mercantile and they often play for the highest bidder. So this was fantastic. I really can't wait to get on to the rest of the series. I'm really, really, really excited for the rest of it. But I had to get it in these brilliant covers. I think, yeah, Picador, you did really well with these ones. Um, and it's one of my favourite um, illustrators, Yuko Shimizu. She does such brilliant um, book illustrations. I have so many of her books, um, what well, books with book covers. But I just love it. And it was really, really good feudal Japanese fantasy with ninjas. Yeah, it was great. I highly recommend. Next, jumping completely in the other direction, we have a... I'm gonna say it's quite dystopian. Um, at, the f at the start though, it's very cleverly written because... At, so at the beginning of Terra Nullius, you follow a group of characters who... quite a large cast of characters actually, and they, they all come into play in certain aspects within this book, but you mainly follow Jackie. Now Jackie has run away from the settlement because he was stolen 
from his family and raised in this like nun schooling and basically the nuns or the head nun hates the children or the natives as she calls them and thinks they're disgusting and then he is then moved to a settlement where uh, there's no slavery in uh, this in the empire but of course they're not getting paid they're basically slaves they're treated worse than that and Jackie was a stable boy and being horribly abused and so he decides to run away and find home and um, this big manhunt starts to find Jackie and but all these other characters come into play and it was really really well done so it starts off as a bit of a as a bit of a really good history into what actually happened for many of the Aboriginal uh, people within Australia well most of the Aboriginal people within Australia during settlement and afterwards going heavily all the way into say I don't know the 1960s it was still occurring um, but it's basically taking you into that viewpoint and seeing it from that perspective and then suddenly there's this really big twist in the middle and I was you can kind of tell something's gonna happen I was waiting for the penny to drop but I didn't quite expect the penny to drop as far as it did um, it was really really well done the twist was brilliant um, and I really liked the writing style I thought it the overall structure of the novel with all the different characters it didn't always mesh well I thought there was a little bit of a clunkiness to the writing at times but I think the effect of what Claire Coleman was going for was very much present and I think she did it handled it very well even though the writing wasn't as spot on as um, I would have liked but at the same time still a brilliant book one I highly recommend because it plays with your mind brilliantly and um, it really challenges your own perceptions of the characters before and after the penny drops so I hope if you pick this one up uh, you let me know down below what you thought or if you have read it let me know down below I, I can't wait to discuss it further then I read all That I Am by Anna Funda. This is a World War II historical novel um, set mainly before the Second World War. I thought it was during, but it is mainly set before. Um, and a group of radicals who were the Socialist Workers' Party, so a bit of a Socialist Communist Party. Um, and they were the radical three thinkers in Berlin. Basically, as soon as Hitler comes to power in 1933, overnight they become um, outlawed. They're no longer allowed to even function or be in Germany so um, many of them get away and the couple that we follow they escape to London and the main character Ruth um, you go with her husband and also her wonderfully free-thinking brilliant feminist um, older cousin called Dora they escape to London and they still try to do many things to Bring people's attention to what it is truly like in Hitler's Nazi Germany. Um, around that time, many people were trying to seek for peace. Many of the countries, although I was highly ignorant of what was happening, or just trying to blatantly ignore it because they'd been through one world war, they didn't want to start another, and they didn't want to acknowledge that one could be happening. So many of these people who were being driven out of their homes were in fact not being listened to or were being criticised for what they were saying. So it is a very wonderful book. It was The writing is absolutely stunning. I was very moved throughout this whole book and <laughs> I did the whole avoidance <laughs> for the last... I could feel it was going to be highly emotional for the last about quarter of the book and I didn't pick it up for two days. I started reading a middle grade. I just I just knew I'd be so heavily emotionally involved with this book and I was. I made myself read that last part and I was so emotionally involved with these these characters in this book. But what I also loved is it not only is just set during the 1930s in England and Europe and Germany, um, but it is also set in 2007 Sydney where Ruth who you realize she has survived the war she she is recounting many of her stories because she has a certain memory loss where she can't really remember short-term memories but all her long-term memories are becoming much more vivid and she's thinking that those people were around or with her and um, but then she sent Ernst Toller who's another of the exiled 
party she receives his manuscript and his edited manuscript which basically includes his lover Dora or Ruth's cousin and it was just beautiful I can't recommend this enough if you want to read a book that really really challenges this idea of a populist government that tries to smother independent free th thought and free thinking and free speech which happens so horrendously often and it's not just something relegated to the past definitely pick this up it's such an important read and I think it's one that will focus more on the human aspect I find that many of World War II fiction they either do like this big romantic gesture or it's all about the action where this focuses on the bare humanity and it really reels it back to like the basic human goodness, kindness and morality. So this was brilliant. I highly recommend. And lastly, which thankfully was my breakfast book club book choice of the month, was The Museum of Modern Love by Heather Rose. This one surprised me. I did know about um, Marina and Bromovich's um, The Artist is Present. I did see uh, lots of video clips and articles about it. It happened in 2010. So I have, I'm, I know of the, um, the performance itself. Uh, but it was so fascinating to see it brought to life within a fiction form. And to have all these satellite characters that you know, swarm around a marina as she's going through this um, really grueling uh, performing art. And you mainly follow the main characters, Arky Levin. And he's very interesting because I have to admit, and thankfully I wasn't the only one in the book club, that I really disliked him for most of the book. He's, he's so unremittently selfish and he doesn't understand other people's pain it's um his pain is always considered first and it's almost to the blindness of other people's emotions so i found him a very hard character to sympathize with especially the situation he finds himself in um i won't go to too much because it really is a wonderful peeling away process to discover arkin to really discover what happened i'll just say at the beginning i thought he um was separated from his wife and um, it was like a mutual separation but you quickly find out that's not the case and it's really really fascinating but there is so much attention drawn to just basic human connection and that's what Marina really did in her art she made sure the the artist was there to gaze into the eyes of the viewer and that gave a completely different experience where this basic human connection was made through the eyes no need to, for body language no need for any like um talking or even sound it was just this basic connection through the eyes this was greatly needed and i think why arky levin was so drawn to that he's a composer so he is artistic and so he would have been drawn to the artistic element of the show anyway but there is such a wonderful comparison to his own personal life within uh, Marina's art. And it's just a really beautiful book. It's beautifully written. The art of the sentences and the structure of the writing matches it so well. Very short um, chapters, so it works really well. And even all the other satellite characters, even though they might not bump into Arky or not know him, um, it's definitely a really lovely storytelling of people discovering themselves or discovering a new direction they want to go all because they have had this wonderful interaction with Marina's artwork and it's really focusing on how art really can be the stimulus of life and how art can really either inspire or change your direction so I really thoroughly enjoy this I think it was such a beautiful homage to Marina and Bromovich but also highlighting how important art is for the world and important her art is because most people would um, don't really take performance artists quite seriously or they can't understand them but this explains it with so much detail that you just cannot help but admire all of those really avant-garde artists that try and make us face some part of ourselves so I really thoroughly enjoyed this and I could highly recommend to 
basically everyone who really enjoys artwork or really wants to discover a bit more about art and humanity. Alright, so the three books that I have highlighted as ones I definitely want to read next. Um, once again, all Australian authors. And the first one is The Lost Flowers of Alice Hart. Kate Howe is so convincing. I really, really wanted to get to this this month, but I just, I couldn't fit it in into my schedule. So I'm definitely going to get to it hopefully in May, if not June. Um, but I really hope to read this one. It's going to be historical fiction set in Australia and talking about native flowers. And I do love the native flowers, especially if you do have this edition um, up here, the Sturt Desert Pea and also the Little Kangaroo Paw are some of my absolute favourite. But obviously you can't go past Proteus and Waratahs, they're gorgeous as well. But yeah, so I really cannot wait to read this one. I rarely read historical fiction set in Australia. It's always a bit of a novelty sometimes, or it's one of the ones that are more like a romance read, which I do enjoy. I definitely do enjoy them, but it's something to have in a Victorian Australian um, recently published novel. Um, that's going to be fabulous. Next is going to be Lady Helen and the Dark Days Pack. This is number two in the Dark Days Pack series by Alison Goodman. I read the first one, or the Dark Days Club, I should say, sorry. And I read the first one and that was really brilliant. And just look at that cover. Look how brilliant they are. Oh, I love it. I really do love these covers. Um, but I, the third one's just come out and I just want to read them. I just want to have some wonderful historical YA goodness and like, dark fantasy brooding regency loveliness so I am so ready to read this series and to finish it off just so I can obsess over it some more and possibly do a reread. And lastly I want to read Axiomatic by Mireille Timokin. Now this was nominated for the Stella Prize unfortunately it did not win but it is a collection of essays on the almost a trauma escape. Trauma escape was another work of hers but it's really looking at how the past shapes the present and so many people discredit the past and being a historian I really cannot discredit the past it is so integral to where we have been and where we are going as a community to so to discredit it or to even try and hide it in a way you have to recognize human ability to fall into that trap and avoid it in the future so I think this would be really interesting because I think it goes more into the Australian mindset so this sounds absolutely fascinating and I do need to read more non-fiction by Australian authors all right so that was my absolutely brilliant hashtag Aussie April I hope you all enjoyed it too if you participated and I just want to say again a big thank you to Doris and Jacqueline for hosting such a wonderful readathon I had so much fun I can't wait to do it again if you're planning to do it again next year and let me know down below any books that you want to read possibly from the ones that I read in April and I'm happy to talk about them further or if there's any books that you would like to read in the future or know more about let me know and we can have a good chat okay I'll see you next time bye